at, at the best of times at the level I got to, it was, uh, yeah, it was a struggle to earn a living. And I, you know, in today's money, I probably earned about twenty-five to thirty thousand a year. And that's why Steve had to reinvent himself. He just wasn't earning enough money doing what actually he loved doing. <laughs> so, but I'm not going to tell you what he was doing because you need to listen to his whole story to get the linkage and the metaphors that related to his past performance to his current performance. This is such an interesting interview such an interesting journey that Steve has gone on. A wonderful story about what he's been experiencing over the years. Um, all I can say is go and listen to the rest of it and enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Steve. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you for asking. Yeah, and you? I'm very well, thank you. I, I know you're on the south of the country, on the coast in Portsmouth. How's the weather there today? Yeah, it's not too bad. It's, uh, you know, sort of a, a slightly cloudy, but, you know, quite warm still. So long may that continue. Yeah, well, it, you know, they do say people that live near the sea uh, are more youthful and they live longer. Well, <laughs> I hope that's the case. I, I, really, <laughs> I live about 500 yards away. So, oh, uh, definitely. It's really nice. Yeah, I've only just moved here a couple of months ago and, uh, yeah, really uh, enjoying and relishing, you know, looking out over the Isle of Wight early in the mornings. Pretty cool. Nice. Very nice. Well done. Well done. Okay, well, let's get started. And um, the first question I ask, I ask everybody the same question, and that's just to kind of get us kicked off with the, with your story. I'm really looking forward to hearing it. it. It's going to be interesting. So tell us a little bit about your personal life to begin with. So where were you born? A bit about your education. We, we just talked about where you now live, but have you moved around before you got to where you got? Okay, um, yeah. Just we get a sense of your, your background from a personal point of view. Okay, sure, yeah, uh, by all means. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I was born born in Sheffield. Um, uh, very, very proud of my heritage. I think when you, uh, when you do leave the area, your, your area you're from becomes even more sort of passionate really so I'm very proud of being a Yorkshireman and very I'm very Yorkshire I think in many ways actually even though you know I've not lived there for a long time right. um, I uh, I went to school um, I had a bit of, school was always a tough time for me I I never really enjoyed it uh, went to a, a place called Stocksbridge High School which mm -hmm. was uh, uh, although I'm from Sheffield I actually lived right on the edge of the Peak district. Right. Uh, it's obviously the national park. So literally 200 yards up the, the top of my road was the start of, I used to call it my playground. You know, it was literally about 30 miles of moorland. And uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, whilst I lived in a city, it was very much, I suppose, a, a, a country style of, uh, of upbringing as, as a child. So, yes. um, yeah. Um, so, so I went to school. I did my bit. I sort of did did basically as little as uh, I possibly could to get by without getting in too much trouble <laughs> from, from either my teachers or my uh, my father. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, you know, and, and I, I did all the all the sort of stuff that boys do. You know, football and 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 wrote, played a bit of rugby and cricket. And mm. Was never any good at anything really. Oh uh, wow. Sport was concerned until yes. at the age of 13, uh, I went on holiday to Butlins. And uh, this particular week, it was uh, Butlins Skeggy, Butlins Skegness. And yes. uh, in true British style, it rained all week. Ah. And uh, so, <laughs> so we decided, you know, what is it we're going to do? And uh, so I decided that I was going to t uh, try playing table tennis. And I just found something I could do. And uh, mm. 
I won the boy of the week. I was very proud of the fact I'd won my first ever trophy. And that really inspired me to carry on playing. And uh, so I was literally, I suppose, 13 and a half then. By the time I was 15, I was playing for Yorkshire. By the time I was 16, I was playing for Yorkshire Seniors. Wow. And at the age of, age of 18, I played my, my first international match against China on my 18th birthday. So I became a, a full-time international table tennis player for 10 years. Hold on, uh, hold on a uh, second. Hold on a second. <laughs> so did you play table tennis before you went to Butlins? No, never. No, I'd never never picked up a bat. And, and you uh, and you won the competition during the time you were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the end of the week I was pretty good. <laughs> In a week of yeah, never yeah, having I, played. No, no. Well, inside four years. I was, you know, playing I was international, you know, I was playing um yeah, I played played a guy called Qiu Yuhua, who ah. was the Chinese world champion. Yes, uh, uh, on my 18th birthday. So four and a half years, I went from beginner to international. I, I got I got my butt kicked uh, <laughs> by by him, but uh, you know it was a great, amazing experience. You know, and uh, oh my what god, thing, what thing to do on your birthday? So um, yeah, that was really interesting. That is mad. I mean, yeah. what what did you think had happened? Well, I don't know. I, 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 I was I was always, I'd say, a very determined child. I was always, you know, I would never give in. You know, I, you know what it's like when you're a kid. You have these games that you play with your dad, like Tig. You know, where you, you know, you have to go and catch them, and then they catch you. And I used to, you know, I could never catch my dad, but I just wore, wore him down. I just, would just never stop, you know. Mm, I mm. just keep running, you know, all the time. And, uh, and 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 so it was with table tennis, really. I I often say that, you know, I started playing at Butlins when I was 13 and a half, and I, I literally did not take a day off until my uh, 80, till, uh, after I was 18. I had played every day. Every wow. day, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, holidays. I never, ever, ever didn't play. And some days I'd play, you know, eight or even ten hours in, in the day. So but, I was I was very motivated. Well, uh, what, what? You know, it, it, I knew I wasn't going to ever get anywhere as a career, you know, because mm. I didn't like school and, and, no. and didn't do particularly well. So I was, you know, really destined, uh, being from Sheffield, to – spend my life working in the steelworks, you know, mm. and, uh, you know, doing some, you know, mundane job that, you know, I really hated. In, in fact, when I left school, I, I got a job as a, uh, something known as a pipe inspector. And uh, that involved uh, pouring, uh, uh, basically putting big, like, gas pipes into uh, compressed air, pouring soapy water over them, seeing if any bubbles appeared, and if they oh, did, there yeah. was a leak, and they got, you know, melted down again. And if, if they passed, then, you know, uh, they'd go and become a gas pipe yes. somewhere uh, in, in the road. And uh, one, one night I was working about 3 o'clock in the morning, and one of my colleagues said, uh, you don't seem very happy, Steve. What, what's wrong? Why are you not – don't you like doing this? Mm -hmm. I said, you know what, I absolutely hate it. And he said, just wait till you've been here 42 years like I have. <gasps> and I looked at him and I said, there's absolutely no way. <laughs> And I, it was like a, it was like the, the change in it. It was like a ceremony. It was like a turning point in my life. I literally, at three o'clock in the morning, you imagine it's middle of January, freezing cold, snow on the ground. Oh. I ripped my overalls off. Um, threw them on this fire. We had this like fire that we'd all huddle round. You yes. Imagine working for British Steel in this place and we're on a tea break and we're all, you know, uh, huddled round the fire. I threw my overalls on the fire and walked out. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that was my notice period. The I, horror. Uh, the I, ho yeah. I arrived home at like uh, half past three in the morning uh, all the house was locked up, you know, with a chain across the door and everything, so I couldn't get in. Oh, no. Uh, I, had to, I had to knock my dad up, 
I have never been in more trouble in my life. I was oh. He said, what are you going to do? You know, you're, you know, you've given up this great job. And I said, I'm going to be a professional table tennis player. Now, at the time, I was like an, a reasonable county standard player, you know, and, and being a table tennis player is not like being a footballer or a, no. uh, a tennis player, you know, it, it, uh, at the best of times, at the level I got to, it was, uh, yeah, it was a struggle to earn a living. And I, you know, in today's money, I probably earned about twenty-five to thirty thousand a year yes. from playing table tennis, which you know is just about enough to. By the time you know you've done all the travelling and stuff, it was it was barely enough to live, really, even mm. even with my parents. But you know, it was great fun. I did it for ten years. Yeah, I mean. It's it's really quite an incredible start to your journey, really. Um, what I what I find so fascinating is how you just embraced it and and spent all of that time practicing. And my question was, or is, who did you play against to get so good? Oh, that's a that's a really good question. I I. I um... I started off, obviously, you know, playing with anybody who, I mean, everybody was better than me. <laughs> so I played with anybody who'd stand there long enough for me to have a game against them. Yes. So sometimes I'd play, you know, in a day with two or three or four different different people. Mm. But as I got better, I, I really um, I really sussed out something I, ne I still teach and preach to this day. And that is, if, if you're going to be good, you've got to get around good people. And, and today, you know, I spend a lot of my life learning from what I call the best in the world. Right. And so I was very determined that rather than stay in Sheffield, once I got better than everybody in Sheffield, I, I sort of didn't see the value in practicing with play, people who weren't as, as good as me. Yes. And uh, that got me a little bit of a, you know, um, uh, possibly I think a few people thought, oh, you know, he's got ideas about his station. He's, he's a bit big headed and, you know, won't practice with us now. Uh, but w that wasn't the case. It was just that I wanted to practice with the best people. So what I decided to do, uh, was to travel over to Manchester, which I did virtually. Uh, I did it probably four days a week. Um, I used to take Fridays off and Saturday and Sunday. We uh, we had a tournament, so we were we were generally playing in in you know national league matches or tournaments or you know some some competition most weekends. Yes, and uh, so I used to go and practice over there with a couple of the well with several of the you know UK's leading players. There were about four players in the top um, uh, top twenty in England, and one guy who was actually the European champion, a guy called John Hilton. Right, uh, was European champion, world number five. So you know he was a he was definitely an influence on me, uh, along with uh, another player called Nigel Eckersley. Good good northern name there, and uh, he he was also ranked about six in England, and uh, he he definitely influenced me, and uh, he he was a, a great practice partner, very very professional in what he did. Wow, and and okay. So you you played against these guys to get better. Yeah. But if, when you practiced, like, where did you practice? At home or somewhere? No, no. We, well, we used to uh, go over to Manchester YMCA and oh, practice over yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, against I, I, each I, other. I, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd practice. Uh, yeah, we, we literally used to get there at nine in the morning. Got uh, it. We, we do drills and things, you know, exercises, certain little routines, probably through to about 12. And then we used to go up to the, the gym and, and do circuit training, 12 to 1. Wow. Quick bite to eat and then matches all afternoon. Um, play till about half five, drive home. Again, bite to eat. Uh, and then down the gym, do some training and then perhaps another run before finishing about nine, uh, get up in the morning and do the same thing again. And that, that was a routine I did, you know, uh, pretty much pretty much for 10 years. So, you know, oh. it, it, you have to put a lot of effort in. Uh, there, there's a table tennis guy, actually, a guy called Matthew Said. 
who is now known as the, I think he's the, the Times newspaper's number one sports reporter. You, you find his stuff everywhere. Uh, a little while ago, he, he wrote uh, a book called Bounce, uh, which is all about, it's all about sport, really. And it's about, um, is, it, is it about talent? Uh, or is it about hard work? Mm. And what's, whilst it's about both those things, it's about the combination between the two, really, and uh, how that impacts people in terms of how to get to be great. And, and uh, Matthew talks about the the ten thousand hours you need to do. Yes. You know, to be, to be expert at something, you need to do ten thousand hours of practice. Yeah. So. You know, that, that takes some doing, you know, that, that's almost like full time for, for 10 years. So, right. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it's a metaphor, isn't it, actually? It is. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, yeah. and I'm sure that will come true when we talk about what you do today in a bit. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's a great start to your life, really, to have experienced what, really? all of that. Yeah. yeah. And, what and a then, then talking, about, talking about where I lived. I, um, I, I also then, towards the end of my career, um, I moved to, to Germany. I mm. played in Germany in the, uh, in the Bundesliga yes. uh, for, for Bayern Munich. <gasps> uh, I, I went over there initially. I played one year for a, a club called uh, G- DJK Kefertile in Mannheim. And then I got transferred uh, over to Bayern Munich. So, so that was um, pretty amazing as well, you know, playing uh, playing there. So, um, yeah, re- really, um, really uh, interesting times in my sort of early and mid twenties. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's you don't see that much of it. Well, you don't see any of it on TV in this country, no. do you? It's it's a funny sport, table tennis. You know, it, it's. It's not a great spectator sport. It's very difficult to appreciate the game, really, because mm. you know, I, I I do a serve, and and it's it's got a very intricate spin on it. I can yes. disguise it and make it very difficult to get back. Yeah. And so on TV, I serve. The player puts it in the net, and you know, it just doesn't look very good. You know, it's no. not particularly a great spectator sport. What it is really good at, and is actually, believe it or not. Um, it's the world's number one participation sport. M- ah. Not many people realise that, but in the UK, fishing is the number one participation sport. <laughs> but but, but in, the, in, in the world, it's played by more people than any other sport. Now, that, that's actually uh, probably because it's the Chinese national yes. sport. And yes. the, you know, there's however many billions of Chinese people uh, in the world. So, you know, that, that obviously uh, massively affects it. But even in this country where it's very much a minor sport, most people have played table tennis, you know, and, mm. Uh, mm. Um, you know, it, it's uh, – and, and there's there's various centres open in, in, in London now. There's a couple of places called uh, – uh, bounce, which are, are like table tennis nightclubs. It's mm, uh, mm. I went down there recently. It's really really cool, and uh, you know you've got you've got sort of twenty tables with people you know eating and having beers and drinks and stuff, and and they're playing table tennis at the same yes. time. So, yes, uh, you know, well, as one, a, as a, yeah, one opened in Birmingham last year. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I yeah. Heard so. yeah, yeah, and yeah, they do cool. like business networking events. Yeah, and doing table tennis and yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. It's it's I've really been, cool. I've been I, in I, it I because I, I volunteer for Crisis Charity in Birmingham, and I was trying to organise okay. an event there for some okay. of our members. And um, and yeah, so I've been in the place, and it's kind of it's a bit dark. There was no windows, yes. but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's yeah. loads of tables uh, yeah. and other little games that they do with um, you know the ping pong balls. Uh, yeah. Not just table tennis. If people don't want to do table tennis, you can do other games as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, I I think that was really innovative and different and new. Yeah, so I do. Yeah, I hope it catches on. Mm, me too. Okay, yeah. so ten years, and how did it come to like a stop then? Well, I got to be about. I was about twenty eight, I think, mm. and I, I, I suddenly it suddenly dawned on me that do you know what, Steve? you're probably as good as you're going to get. You know, my, my aim was always, always since I was like 
I think I literally picked it up the first week I played. I was going to be world champion. Yes. I wanted to be the world champion. Now, yes. I didn't get anywhere near that level. I, the, the highest I got was number six in England. Oh, that's pretty um, good. Uh, I, I won lots of tournaments. I beat some really good players. I beat the, the world number five, the world number three, the number 14. Wow. You know, and, and so I, I was able to play at a really high level. Yes. I, I, I didn't really do it consistently enough to ever get, you know, to be one of the, you know, the best players in the world. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I was pretty good on my day, let's put it that way. Yes. And uh, so I got to be about 27, 28, and I thought, you know, perhaps this is it. Perhaps this is as good as I'm going to get. Um, I was, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, maybe getting married and stuff like that. And right. Settling down. I thought, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to – I've been doing this long enough now. It's time to move to the next phase of my life and mm. do the next thing that I'm going to do. Great. And then what did you do next? <laughs> what did I do? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I did next was um, through my contacts in table tennis, I got a job working for a company called World of Sport, who are a sports promotion agency. And I started doing table tennis exhibitions. And, and they did things like uh, they, they provide sports people into um, generally the tourism and holiday industry. So they worked for you know companies like Butlins and Pontins, Warner Holidays, Ladbroke Holidays, Ho Seasons, and so on. All these big companies, and they they provide um, you know snoo snooker stars, darts, table tennis, uh, wrestlers, uh, sports celebrities, um, you know swimmers and. And footballers, a lot of footballers work for us. And they travel around all these different holiday centers doing demonstrations, uh, personal appearances, you know, signing autographs and photos and things like that, giving talks and so on and so forth. Yes. And uh, I got involved with them. Initially, I was doing table tennis exhibitions, but pretty soon I got involved in the marketing side of the business. Right. And, uh, and again, I... I, I I got pretty good pretty quick. I thought, right, who's the best in the world? Who can I go and learn from? Yeah. And, uh, and I literally paid for myself to go over to America to attend a, a workshop by a guy called Jay Abraham. Yes. Now, at the time, and I'm talking a long time ago, this is, what, 1988, 89, something mm. like that, mm -hmm. I paid £1,700 of my own money which was more than my car was worth at yeah, the time, massive. to go on a four-day workshop with Jay because yeah. he was the best marketer in the world. Right. Uh, and that's how he built himself. And uh, it, it, it absolutely shocked me when I got there to realize that there were 2,000 people there. Yes. Now, 2,000 times 1,700 pounds uh, I'm not quite sure how much that is, but it's it's not bad for four days. No. Uh, uh, so that uh, that I think sowed the seed of you know wow you know perhaps one day I might be able to you know do this type of thing myself and, yes. and be up there on the stage and deliver marketing training and so on. So that definitely sowed the seed, but it also helped me to take World of Sport from a, not not quite a startup when I joined them, but they were only a, a small business. Uh, inside five years, uh, again, we'd, we were we were the UK's number one sports promotion agency. Right. And uh, we, um, we did all the sport for all the uh, holiday centres and, uh, and, you know, places like uh, Sport England and so on and so forth. So, right. Uh, it was a huge success really, really quickly. We, we, we actually got on the crest of a wave because it was at the time when things like snooker and darts were really becoming popular. Yes. You know, all on TV and everything. Yes. So, so, so that was a real, real big boost when we got all these, um, you know, snooker stars and darts professionals. Uh, and it was, it was a great time in my life as well, you know. I'll always remember my, my first morning there uh, the phone rang. It was about half past 10, and I picked the phone up. Hello, World of Sports, Steve Mills speaking. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. And this voice said, 
uh, yeah, uh, could I speak to Colin, please? I said, certainly, yeah. Who is it speaking? He said, it's Bobby Moore. Oh, went, my God. I put my hand over the phone. I went, it's Bobby Moore. It's Bobby Moore. It's Bobby Moore. I was totally straight. <laughs> oh, totally. I had pictured of Bobby Moore on my bedroom. It's Bobby Moore. And, uh, you know, so, so it was great to, you know, spend time around some of those, you know, celebrities and people that, uh, you know, I, um, uh, I got involved with. Um, it was it made the next, uh, you know, next phase of my life really interesting, meeting all those people mm. and spending time with them, and, uh, and and a few of which I'm still friends with today. So that's really well. Cool. I mean, yeah, but well, you were rubbing shoulders with some of the the stars, but you were a star in your own right too. <laughs> you know? Well, in a, in a very small world, I was. Yeah, I was world famous in table tennis. Actually, that's not quite true. <laughs> I was famous in England <laughs> and, and sort of known by some people in the world. Yeah, uh, work, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, sounds sounds amazing, and and. Was that the main job that you were doing there, the kind of marketing? Yeah, it, mm. w it was. Yeah, well, it was that and, and playing, you know, still doing table tennis okay. exhibition. Okay. So I, I, I combined the two. But it, it was also, I suppose, a little bit operational, you know, mm. organizing people to go places and do things and making sure stuff happened and that people knew where they should be. And, um, you know, occasionally when something went wrong, you know, yes. um, trying to sort that out and uh, so it, it but but my role essentially was to to market the business yes. and, and help it to grow brilliant brilliant and then what happens what happened after that then steve well i, I did that for about six years and uh, and, and as i said the the spark had been ignited you know i really um liked the idea of uh one day running my own business and providing uh, marketing advice and support. So I, I didn't just do the Jay Abraham thing, but I, you know, really, really set about marketing in the same way, in the same attitude that I'd done with uh, with table tennis. Yes. So I thought, right, who else is there? What else do I need to know? Yes. So, you know, in, in the last, I don't know, 25 plus years, I've probably spent, you know, probably more money on learning about marketing than anybody else in the UK, I, I, I would probably imagine. Wow. Uh, you know, I've literally spent many, many thousands of pounds. I've spent, I, I've probably done the, the 10,000 hours of, of marketing learning. Yes. Uh, um, uh, that, that is required to be an expert at that level. And uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I just set about my quest to, to get to, you know, uh, a level that was, you know, much higher than most people in terms of my, my knowledge and expertise. Mm -hmm. And then one day after about six years, I thought, right, this is it. I'm going to go for it. And I did set up my business in 1995 on the 1st of May. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> what? And and did you have, did did like somebody did you have somebody who became your client like straight away that you were so brave to get started on well, yeah yeah well i i i took a bit of a um uh, a, a sort of safety net with me mm. um because i'd done a bit of uh, throughout my my table tennis career i'd done a bit of table tennis coaching right i decided you know day day one uh, perhaps i ought to continue to do some table tennis coaching uh evenings and weekends yes. so i knew you know worst case scenario i'd got a bit of money you know uh coming in um even if i didn't manage to win any business so i, I think that was a good move really yes. it's difficult because you know you work all day and then you go and play and coach table tennis in, in the evenings and weekends but it, it was a it was definitely a wise thing to do. It's a sensible it, approach, know. isn't it? To yeah, I, I think so. You know, it's it's almost edging your bets. You know, you you know, you go into a business, and the you know the hardest time they always say is the first year, mm. followed by the first five years. You know, the stats are, are really scary. That you know, apparently about eighty percent of small businesses fail within five years, mm. and uh, 
you know that that's that always um you know it's, 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 it's something i'm trying to do something about um although i'm sure i can only make a small impact but that's definitely part of my mission yes to try to help small businesses to succeed i think it's uh they say it's easier these days to start a business because of digital technology and yeah. you know you can have a website up within a few hours uh if sure. you plan it correctly uh there's so much social media out there kind of oversaturated at the moment i do believe but if uh -huh. if you learn the strategies then yes something could ha could come from it however and I did this wrong when I started my business um, quite a while ago now too, but you you think you can just make it happen. You know, the, this when you finally yeah. get the bug and you kind of go, right, that's it, I'm getting out of here. I've had enough. I want to do my own thing. This is what I'm going to do. It. And you're totally committed to it. And you do everything that you think is right. And you're learning on the fly. And you make mistakes, but you still keep going. If you don't get that customer or you haven't got a customer from day one that trusts you from the beginning, it makes it very tough. And, and it was a very tough journey for me to, be, to begin with uh, yeah. because I started my business when the recession hit and that was not no. easy at all. No, no, no. So, no. so yeah, I, I concur. Uh, Keeping something in your back pocket that, you know, whether it's something that you're doing on the side anyway, or, you know, the person, the people that you're leaving, keeping them as a friend uh, and they could become your first customer. And lots of people I've interviewed, that's what they did to begin with. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I mean, I, 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 d I did a similar thing in many ways. I, I thought, right, you know, who do I know? Well, I know people in table tennis. I know people in sport. So mm. I thought, you know what? That, that's what I know. That's what I love. I'm going to kick off by uh, going and marketing in, in that industry because yes. that's what I've done. So I was, I was going to people that uh, I, I did quite a bit for uh, local authorities, strangely enough. Uh, but local authority leisure departments, so people who ran sports centers and stuff like that. So I, I put on a, a workshop called How to Market Your Leisure Facility mm. and get 20 people to give me, you know, 150, 200 pounds to each to come along to a, a, a workshop. And, uh, you know, when I, I, I did that, I'd, I'd then pick up a few clients from there. So, so I, I got people in the door with a you know a small amount of money yes. and then some of them would uh, you know uh, want to know more mm. i then got into doing some stuff for universities university leisure and uh, that that was uh, that was a real i mean it, it wasn't particularly uh, a planned thing but it worked out incredibly well because uh, on one of these workshops that i ran uh, we had uh, oxford university came along and uh, afterwards, they said, oh, would you write as a marketing plan? Mm. So uh, this, this guy from Sheffield who had no formal education, uh, you know, left school with a couple of O-levels and three CSEs, suddenly found himself writing a marketing plan for Oxford University, which I've always thought was one of the, the weirdest things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, amazing privilege. And... Uh, you know, it gave me huge credibility. Of course, um, in, the, in the day, you know, yeah, written one, written one for Oxford University. You would assume that he knows what he's talking about. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, so so th that was a really good thing. So, I, and and I just sort of you know expanded out from there. But I, I think you're right, Michael. You know, it's a it's a really good thing to you know think about. Right, who do you know when you're starting out? I often, when I, when I work with clients, I say to them things like, okay, what's the low-hanging fruit here? Yes. You know, your business, you know, who is there that you know? Uh, who do they know? You know, who did you used to work with? Mm. Uh, who do you go networking with? Mm. You know, who do they know? You know, who's your accountant? How many clients have they got? You know, could they recommend you into somebody? And so on and so forth. So that, that for me, I think, is... Um, you know, it's um, it's common sense, but it's actually not that common. 
uh, a lot of people, um, you know, just going to spend in a load of money on things that they don't know whether it's going to work or not. And, uh, you know, wake up one day having spent a load of money on marketing that often no. doesn't work. I know. I was speaking to a startup business and the two things they felt would work for them was a getting their website done fair enough but the website yeah. has to be found uh yeah and b going to facebook advertising and yeah I'm, and i'm like okay how, how deep are your pockets <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. you think one little yeah. advert for 36 quid is going to bring you in all the customers uh, I, you know just a couple of things on those two things uh, you know it, it, it's it's an interesting concept isn't it you know but you know w websites there's two keys i believe to website success one is traffic the other is conversion yes you know and yet people spend a fortune on design and yes so on and so forth so, you know all you got to do is get people to the site and get the right people to the site and enough of them and then make sure they they inquire make sure enough of them inquire um as, as for you know facebook advertising it, it, it comes down to I, i'd say probably lack of expertise i've got a sign on my wall here um but i've got about three or four big big signs that i have on the wall and it says um it's probably that you're not doing the wrong marketing. It's more likely that you're doing the right marketing in the wrong way. Yes. And uh, that, I think, is very true with most businesses. So it's probably not that Facebook advertising wouldn't work for that company. It's just, you know, if it did, if it, I'm assuming it didn't work. And if it didn't work, it's because they didn't get it right. You know, mm -hmm. most marketing doesn't work, uh, not because you know, it, it couldn't work. It's just because they, the combination of what they've done, maybe they targeted the wrong people or the wrong message, the wrong offer, the wrong landing page or the wrong headline and so on and so forth. So, um, I think, yeah. I think what it was is that a lot, there's lots of small businesses out there who believe who've been told there is a silver bullet they've been on a workshop or a course yeah yeah and they want to learn everything yeah. they can do and they think it's a silver bullet thing that you only need to use once but you know the trouble is it's back to that 10,000 hours philosophy yeah it is it is um you've yeah. just got to keep grafting and and be consistent and try different things uh rather yeah. than believing yeah. that there is just one thing that's going to make it happen yeah i i i talk to uh, now to a lot of businesses about you know the three most important things in marketing are testing testing and testing <laughs> you know a bit like buying a house location 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 you know and uh, I often say to them, don't, don't listen to marketing advisors like me. Uh, get proof of concept, yes. you know, before you invest. You know, um, uh, proof of concept is about testing something. You know, go, if you're going to go networking, uh, for example, then, then go, you know, uh, measure what's working, test different approaches, saying different things when you stand up and do your one minute, Try different networking events. Uh, make sure that you follow up and do that as in different ways. Try different things to see what gets the best result, and uh, and and really uncrack the code that is networking. Have a process that works as well as uh, could be. Yeah. And uh, and always always measure what's working and what's not. Yeah. Uh, you know. Again, I learned that in table tennis. You know. Um, I used to know that that my 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 for I mean, it's it's a bit technical, but my forehand serve with side spin and top spin on it. Mm. I used to win seventy percent of my points when I did that. Mm -hmm. So so when it became juice, you know, and I, I I'm serving, I've got to win that point. Guess which serve I did, and uh, and it's the same now in business. You know, it's like. You know, fire your big guns first. You know, let's. Uh, you know, you want to. You need to win some business right now. What's your best chance? Well, it might be uh, referral, for example. Mm. You know, uh, maybe that you've won a significant amount of your business from word of mouth from referral. So let's have a look at your referral system mm. and let's try to you know improve that. Yes. So that, you know, 
that's that's always been my think, thinking. And again, I think it relates back to the Yorkshire background. You know, we have a reputation of being thrifty. You yes. know, and uh, you know, not waste it. We don't like to waste money mm. in Yorkshire. Mm. You know, and uh, and and that's how I approach marketing. You know, it's uh, I, I sometimes call it Yorkshire marketing. You know, it's it's like marketing without the the, the BS and um, by making sure that what you know you measure what's working you. Uh, uh, analyze it. You take action, but you, you know, you do so in a um, uh, a tested, measured way. Yes. And then once you've got proof of proof of concept, uh, you know, if you know that for every pound you spend, you get ten back. How often would you like to do that? Yeah. For me, you know, I do it all day, every day. Happy to spend a million if I had it. But you know, as 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 I develop my marketing, I just do more of it until you know I, I get to the level. Um, you know, saturation point in terms of my business, really, or at least get to where I want to go. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's. So that's a really great. Some some great nuggets in there, and what you're sharing. And thank you for sharing that. And, that's okay. And I know our listeners will really benefit from that. So tell us a little bit about your company, which is called Crofton. Um, it is. Um, so, in essence. Yeah, tell us a little bit about how you help companies. You, you've already shared a little bit, but um, give us the, yeah. the kind of um, your kind of uh, signature speech about that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, essentially, the company does three different things. We're a small team of people. There, there's six of us all together, and we do uh, three things. We we do what we we offer what we call a done for you service. Um, this is where businesses outsource all their marketing or part of their marketing to us. Mm -hmm. And um, most of our clients in that area have, have one of a few problems. They either d don't have time to do it um, or some of them don't know how to do it. As you mentioned now, you know, in a digital age where everything's much more complex uh, than it was, you know, when I started out, it was basically buy, buy the biggest yellow pages advert you can afford and send out loads of, of, of leaflets, yes. you know. Um, I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek there, but, you know, it certainly was nowhere near as complex and, uh, you know, uh, uh, difficult to do now as it, as it is. And, and also, you know, times change so quickly, as you, you said earlier in the interview, you know. Uh, the, what we're doing on LinkedIn right now in six months' time will probably be totally different. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's certainly in the last year it's it's changed massively, and uh, so uh, so we we offer a, a, a service, a done for you marketing service for people who either don't know what to do, uh, they don't like doing it, or they don't have time to do it. You know, marketing sometimes not their thing. And, and we do that type of work. Uh, the, the other thing we do, and we, we do increasingly, is provide advice, coaching, and mentoring. So, you know, we've we got clients out there who, who really want to grow their business, but they're, 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 there's a whole bunch. And when I say a bunch, I, I think there's something like 3.2 million people uh, run businesses in the UK. Wow. It's something like uh, I'm probably slightly out, but it's definitely over three million yeah. of us, and uh, a phenomenal amount of those. I think it's something like ninety-six percent of them uh, don't turn over more than fifty thousand. Mm. And I mean, I, you know, for me that is a real shame. And uh, so, so I, I developed a program uh, that I call the Results Accelerator Program, which is essentially it's about how to get to the first hundred k. Yeah, how to get startup or from a business where you're a, like a one man band or one woman band earning earning a living but would really like to get it to 100k or, or above you know i got some clients who are on the program who turn over you know i got one client who um when he came to me was turning over 260 he's now uh, this year is going to hit 580 you know so you know that, that that's good growth 
Um, so we offer this program, Results Accelerator program. And then the third thing we do is uh, we do lots of workshops, as, as already mentioned. So uh, I run workshops on LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube marketing. I'm a massive believer in YouTube marketing. I also really love podcasts. Uh, you know, they're a great way of uh, getting, you know, getting known and getting your message out there. I got my own podcast, and uh, you know, obviously, I'm on your podcast today, <laughs> and uh, other people's podcasts, and, yes. and it's brilliant. It's, you know, it, it, it amazes me that more people um, don't do it. Yeah, I, mean, I it's agree. Such a great way of, of, of marketing. And um, and then, you know, to be honest, I, I do lots of freebies. I, I give a lot of stuff away, mm. you know. I, I, I'm, I'm, my mission is to try and help as many small businesses as I can. Yes. That's ultimately what I'm about. Fantastic. And so, you know, I give loads of uh, – I mean, if, if you go on YouTube, I've got uh, 380 videos on there, all, all basically information, you know, ideas and ways – Businesses can grow their their business, and uh, you know I, I've got loads of free stuff on my website and so on. So I, I really do believe that as an advisor, it's important to to allow people to to try your service, and once they know that actually you do know what you're talking about, they'll they'll you know some of them will come back and want to pay you money for your expertise, mm. and and that's really my my ethos that's what I, I believe in so brilliant thank you for that that's a really fabulous summary i've, I've just thank got you. a one question or a couple of questions have come up in my mind just to delve a okay. little bit deeper uh sure. let's call it go behind the scenes a little bit and that is ask you you got a team of six so if yeah. you were to list the skills of your company like the six people in the company it's give us a give us a sense of what can people expect to be able to tap into those skills. So, okay. do, do you know what I mean? So, so I got, yeah, yeah. So, um, I've I've got a guy a uh, guy called Lee Lee Gilbert who works for me. He only works for me part time, but he's our techie guy. Yes, uh, Lee can do stuff like uh, build websites. Um, you know, coding. Yeah. Um, he's also a really, really good marketer. Very, very switched on guy. And uh, yeah, but but he, he comes in where where Steve uh, disappears, and that is on the technical side. Got you it. know, I'm not not a techie by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, so so if it's something technical, uh, then then Lee's the man. Yeah. He, he's also highly proficient in things like Google paper click advertising yes uh, so he really really knows and understands that and uh, uh, so the same thing applies so if somebody comes to me and says look can you manage Google paper click mm -hmm. or SEO for us then we say yes and and Lee would be the man that does that got it um, I've then got a couple of ladies who um, uh, Hannah and Miranda who do work uh, on things like social media. That that's a real big one for us. Uh, more and more people, um, you know, are getting into social media marketing. A lot of people are realizing, do you know what? I really don't have time for this. Mm -hmm. uh, or we hear, hear things like, you know, I really don't know what to say on social, you know, and, uh, you know, if you're looking at posting, you know, let's say multiple times a day on social media, uh, people have a problem doing that. And so we, we take on that work and um, but m mainly the two uh, two ladies do that for uh, our clients. Yes. Uh, we've, we've got a, a copywriter, uh, Diane, who, um, uh, again, pretty much does what, does what it says on the tin. She writes copy for people. Um, we've got uh, another trainer, Jim, who, who does uh, quite a lot of uh, marketing strategy type work. I, my, the training I tend to do is the advisory work, and pretty much I do all the uh, you know the the, the marketing op what I call the open seminars, things like how to use LinkedIn to grow your business is coming up, and we've got another one how to turn leads into um, 
into meetings. So there are two seminars coming up. So I deliver those and I deliver all the results accelerator program um, and, um, and do all that type of work. So, so we got, you know, people with different skills, um, different backgrounds. Uh, I'm, I'm here in Portsmouth, but I'm the only one. I'm the only person here. We've got a lady that works <coughs> literally down the road. We've got um, another one is in um, uh, Andover. Lee is based in Peterborough. Uh, so, you know, we're, 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 it's, it's amazing. In fact, fact, we've actually got a lady that's worked for us for many, many years as well who uh, is, is work, works for us in Romania. Right. You know, so, so we're we're like a small business, but you know, we're not quite not quite global. But you know, it's interesting again how the world's changed. Mm. You know, I have a daily meeting with the um, with uh, Iona, uh, a name in um, in Romania, and we do that meeting on Zoom dot com, um, and uh, you know, it works works fantastically well. And uh, she's really switched on. She's worked for me for three or four years. And uh, uh, she's coming over for Christmas. We, <laughs> we're going to invite her over. So she's very excited about that. She's never been here. So we're going to invite her over to our Christmas party. So Brilliant. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, I mean, that gives a good insight into the kind of skill base and what you're able to cover for people. So my second question, uh, and I know, I know you have to go shortly, so um, – Kind of last question then. Well, second to last question. Uh, okay. Go on. Bye, is um, so let's say somebody came to you, let's say a startup, and okay. they needed the whole shebang doing. They they needed to, you know, have a website done. They need to do the get the branding done. Their, you know, their identity. Their, you know, how to present it. How to you know, to, to kind of get their marketing from scratch. Is that something yeah. you do for people? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Um, we, we'd, uh, initially, you know, we, we'd obviously have a, an initial meeting and get a, a, an understanding of where they are right now. Mm. You know, what, what have they actually got as far as resources? How far down the route are they? Mm. You know, are they literally starting out and got to, you know, decide on a company name or, yes. you know, um, you know, wh wh whereabouts are they? So get an understanding of where they are. And then really importantly for us, it's, it's what do you want, you know, mm. and when do you want it? Mm. You know, what, what are your aims, um, you know, for the business and where do you see it in, you know, six months, a year, two years, five years, you know, wh what's the ultimate goal? And, and then we, we sort of track back and say, right, okay, if we're going to do this, what do we need to do in the next three months? Because I, I think one of the problems and one of the things that puts off a lot of small businesses with things like business planning is, is they, they just get a little bit sometimes turned off by it mm. because – you know, it's it's all about you know my five year vision. Mm. You know, most of them don't have a clue what they're going to do in the next month, let alone about in five years. Yes, and so so we like to work. You know, right? What what are your goals for tomorrow? You know, mm. you know, how many phone calls are you going to make? Yes. You know, how many people are you going to ask to connect to you on LinkedIn mm. this week? Mm. So so it, we're we're very very. Um, action orientated in terms of what we do. And we, we use this really cool piece of software. It's called Teamwork, teamwork.com. <clears throat> it's a project management software, uh, but we use it to set up people's uh, marketing plans. Right. So it, it's online. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's on the mobile and everything. So people have got, got their plan in front of them and they can wake up in the morning you know, click on a box and see all the tasks that they've got to do today yeah. in terms of their marketing and tick them off when they're done. And, uh, and and it's a great way of operating because not only can they see it, but we can see it as well. And so we know in live time whether they've done what they said they were going to do. Yes. And so, you know, I, I, I'm there and uh, Miranda as well. Uh, a, a key part of her job is to chase people to get them to do stuff right. that they they're going to do that they haven't done and and that to be honest is quite a big job you know 
because uh, you know I'm, I'm sure with your experience, you you know you you've seen many times where people have said they're going to do something and then it doesn't actually get done. Yes. It's a bit like joining the gym. They they join the gym with good intentions, but you know a few weeks in, you know that that intention seems to wane a little bit, and they finish up you know going to the gym once a month. And it doesn't really do them any good, and they, you know, finish up getting home, you know, with their back aching and their arms and legs, and can hardly mm. walk and think I'm not doing that again. And uh, so, so we, you know, we we really try to make sure that our our clients, um, you know, uh, take take actions themselves, and uh, that that we support that by doing, uh, you know, whatever's agreed, dependent on on their budget really mm. and what what they can afford. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, we absolutely do help people from from the ground upwards. Okay, brilliant. That's that's really useful to know because I come across quite a few people when I'm out networking that are at that level. And, um, you know, there's, there's an amazing amount of people who are interested to go it alone, but they're also afraid and they need, you know, their hands holding yeah. sometimes. Okay. Uh, the, the, the- there's a brilliant book by a guy called Michael Gerber called The E-Myth. Have you heard I of it? I have heard of it, yes. I never yeah. read it, but I definitely have heard okay. of it. Yeah. Well, I, re- I recommend you read it. It's a great book for anybody starting out in business. And th- there are many things it covers, but I'd just like to just talk about one, if I may, yes. for a minute. Yes, yeah, sure. He, he says that in, in every business, there are three departments. There's finance, there's marketing, and there's operations, even in a one-man business. You know, in Vodafone, they've got that. And in a one-man business, uh, you know, doing doing cut, cutting grass, there's still three departments. Yes. And uh, typically, most business owners have expertise in operations, right? They're good at doing the work. So they, you know, the hairdresser opens her own hairdressing salon. Uh, a, a mechanic opens his, his or her own garage. Yes. An uh, accountant opens their own accountancy practice, and so on and so forth. Believing just because they're good at doing the work of the business that they can run a business that does that work. Mm-hmm. And as Gerber said, it just ain't true mm. because you know the. F- a lot of businesses go bust because of the financial side of the business is not man- managed effectively. Mm. You know, the, the, the cash flow is poor. You know, they're not charging enough often. Uh, they're not managing the money as well as they could because they don't have that expertise. The bookkeeping's messed up. You know, it, it, it's just not done very, very well. And so they wake up one day and realize, you know, that they're in deep doo-doo. They owe VAT, they owe the corporation tax, and so on and so forth. On the flip side, they're also pretty much rubbish at selling and marketing. Yeah. You know, they've they're, they're no training in it. They, you know, uh, I, I was up in Birmingham the other day uh, speaking at an event with a 1,000 people in the room. And I said, hands up who's responsible for sales. I got a 1,000 hands. I then said, hands up, who's done any sales training in the last three months? I got about three hands. (laughs) How about the last year? About 20 hands. Who's done any sales training in the last five years? I got about 60 hands. Mm. 60 out of a 1,000 who are responsible for sales. I said, the rest of you, I said, you've got, you know, 940 people in this room who are responsible for selling and could not even be bothered to go and get some sales training in order to improve uh, the effectiveness. Mm. I do sales training every day, every single day, without fail. Mm. Just a, just a little bit sometimes, just half an hour of it, uh, but I, I, I do it every day. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons for business failure, mm. that they, they, they're, they're, they're good operationally, you know, really good at what I do, whether it's making something or offering a service, I'm really good at that, but I hate doing accounts and managing the money, and I'm no good at sales and marketing. And so they wake up one day and realize that, you know, that, that those two things are holding yeah. them back. 
So, so yeah, really good. I mean, there's other really good examples yes. of what to do about it in there. But uh, great book. You can buy it on Amazon. I'm not on commission. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, Steve. I, that, I enjoyed hearing that nugget. That's brilliant. You've given so many. Um, really appreciative. Um, I feel we've gone over time a little bit, so but I, I appreciate okay. everything that you've shared with us. So tell us how can people find you? Share, you know, where where they can find you, website, okay. etc. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, firstly, Michael, just say thank you ever so much for interviewing me. It's been a real pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm pleased that you said, you know, it, it's added value. That that was really my um, my mission in coming on here to try and help people. So if they want to know more from me, uh, probably the best thing to do is to go to my website, which is stevemills.co. So just to clarify, Steve, then M-I-L-L-S, and then .co, okay? People sometimes go, oh, what, what did you say, .com? No, .co, so <laughs> it's .co. Um, what you can do on there, there's a page called Strategy Meeting. Um, it's actually a, res a results meeting. And uh, people can book a free meeting with me, and that can be either in our office in Portsmouth, it could be on Zoom online or on the phone. And, uh, you know, anybody listening to the podcast today, if you're in business and you want to do better, then step one would be set up a free, no obligation uh, meeting. And we can talk about your marketing and what you're doing and where you want to go. Great. Uh, anywhere else apart from your website or you, you prefer them to uh, go yeah. there? No, no, I mean, that's great. Or, you know, go and find me on LinkedIn. Yes. Uh, if you type in, I'm sure there's quite a few Steve Millses. Um uh, around, uh, uh, including, I think it's the, um, the, 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 there's a guy called Steve Mills who runs, um, I forget what it is, but it, it's one of the top American um, base uh, baseball um, clubs. Oh, right. And so he, he's all over everything. He's very annoying because <laughs> sometimes he, he keeps me off being, you know, number one on Google under Steve Mills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's so famous, you know. Uh, I, I think it's one of the New York ones, actually. So New York Yankees or something like yes. that. I don't know. Yes. One, one of them. Uh, uh, but anyway, yeah. So uh, uh, to, to find me on LinkedIn. Uh, Steve Mills, uh, Portsmouth will probably get me. Uh, check out my channel on YouTube again. Steve, Steve Mills Marketing, if you type that into uh, Google, uh, you you definitely find me. Yeah. And also... Uh, check out my my videos on um, uh, on YouTube. Well, I just uh, tried that. I typed in Steve Mills Marketing, and you're number one. <laughs> yay. Well, that's good. And you've got your <laughs> Google page, business page on the right. You got yeah the Prudent Marketer. You've got your yeah yeah yeah. yeah. So yeah, you're all over it. So well done. Oh, that's good to it. Good to yeah. it. <laughs> so people can definitely find you there. No problem. Yeah. Okay, Steve. Well, thank you very much. I, I definitely hope we meet in person. So if you do come to Birmingham again, you know, give me a shout and we'll can... I certainly will. That would be that would be great. I mean, and no doubt I, I will be in Birmingham at some point. Yeah, I'm not in Birmingham, so I need to travel for about 45 minutes. Okay. But uh, just give me a shout. I do do a lot of networking in Birmingham anyway. So I'll come in, okay. we'll have a coffee and have a chat a bit further and a bit deeper about what's going on. And but in the meantime, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and speak to you soon. My pleasure. And thank you very much. Take care. Bye for now. Bye for now. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 